brakes use friction to slow and stop a moving vehicle and hold it in place. Friction is the force that resists motion when objects slide or roll against one another. On disc brakes, friction is produced as stationary calipers clamp against a rotor, which turns along with the car's wheel. When the lining material on the caliper pad contacts the spinning rotor, friction is produced where the two surfaces meet. Friction also produces heat some of which is radiated into the surrounding air. The brake linings and the rotor absorb the rest. Excessive heat buildup causes heat checking. On drum brakes, friction is produced when brakes are applied and the shoes move outward to force the linings into contact with a rotating drum. On either system, as the brake pedal is depressed, brake pressure and friction increases. Friction slows down the rotation of the wheels. As the wheels slow down, friction increases between the tires and the surface of the road. It is this force, the friction between the rolling tires and the road surface, that actually slows and stops the vehicle. Brakes work most effectively when the wheels roll rather than skid to a stop. If brakes are applied so hard that wheel rotation is stopped while the vehicle is still moving, the tires lose traction and skid along the road surface. Therefore, brake pressure should be sufficient to produce enough friction to stop a car in the shortest possible distance. The brake systems used by General Motors are designed so that brake fluid pressures are properly balanced at each wheel from side to side, and from front to rear. For optimum brake performance operation, tires and wheels must be in good condition, and all brake and related suspension components must be maintained in proper operating condition. The condition of the braking surfaces also affects the smoothness of brake operation. On disc brakes, for example, the surfaces of the rotor should be flat and parallel with each other. To maintain full and consistent contact between the linings and the rotor, the face of the lining should be relatively flat and the rotor should be free from irregularities such as cracks or deep scoring. On drum brakes, the interior of the drum should be round and the curve of the brake shoe and lining should conform to the drum so that the two maintain full contact. When brake surfaces do not conform properly to one another, Roughness or vibration occurs when the brakes are applied. And most important, any harshness in braking action detracts from the smooth ride and handling characteristics that are hallmarks of Buick cars. Pulsation is directly related to brake components and wheel bearing systems. There are a number of possible causes for brake pulsation. This program shows how to diagnose and correct cracks or scoring on drums and rotors. Excessive runout in the rotor, hub, and bearing system. Variation in rotor thickness, also known as non-parallelism, and out-of-round drums. Anytime a brake pulsation or similar handling-related complaint is received, the first diagnostic step is always to test drive the car. The test drive is used to get a feel for the exact nature of the problem. It allows determination of whether brake pulsation is actually the problem or if the customer complaint is caused by another source, such as the drivetrain, tires, or road surface. The test drive is also used to determine if the pulsation is caused by the front or rear brakes. Pulsation is more commonly caused by the front brakes, however, because the parking brake operates only the rear brakes, rear brake pulsation is more easily isolated. The rear brake should therefore be tested first. Accelerate the car to approximately 20 miles per hour. Place the gear selector in neutral. Hold the parking brake release lever in the return position to prevent the parking brake from setting. Then apply the parking brake lightly to slow the car. As the car slows, check for signs of pulsation or roughness in the parking brake pedal 
or vibration coming from the rear of the car. If any sign is observed, inspect the rear brakes. Remember, before removing a brake drum, mark the drum and one of the studs so the drum can be returned to the same position. Cracks and scoring on the braking surface of a drum often cause rear brake pulsation. Cracked drums must always be replaced. If scoring is deeper than 20 thousandths of an inch, the drum should be refinished. A maximum rebore diameter for refinished drums is provided in the service manual. If a satisfactory finish cannot be obtained without exceeding this specification, the drum should be replaced. To check for an out-of-round condition, measure the diameter of the drum in at least two locations, 90 degrees apart. If two diameter measurements vary by more than 10 thousandths of an inch, refinish the drum or replace it if there is insufficient material for resurfacing. If replacing or refinishing the drum does not completely solve a rear brake pulsation problem, check for lateral runout in the wheel bearing and hub assembly. If no pulsation is felt during the parking brake test, rear brakes can be eliminated as the cause of the complaint. Then the front brakes should be tested by applying the full service brakes. Once again, accelerate the car to 20 miles per hour, shift into neutral, then apply light pressure on the brake pedal to slow the car. Check for roughness or pulsation in the brake pedal or other vibrations when the brakes are applied. If no pulsation is felt during a 20 mile per hour stop, repeat the test, this time accelerating to 45 to 50 miles per hour before applying the brake with medium pedal pressure. If still no pulsation is felt, heat up the brake system by performing 10 consecutive stops from approximately 30 miles per hour and then repeat the 20 mile per hour test. If no pulsation is experienced, examine the tires, wheels, suspension and drivetrain for other possible causes of the customer's complaint. If pulsation is felt during the front brake tests, carefully examine the front wheel and brake system. Check that the wheels and tires are in good condition. Turn each wheel by hand and check for noises or binding that might indicate caliper drag. Remove the wheel, loosen the calipers, and hang them where they do not interfere with rotating surfaces. Use a grease-free cloth dampened with water, denatured alcohol, or brake cleaning fluid to clean the rotor and calipers for inspection. Examine the rotors for any obvious irregularities, such as cracks or heavy scoring on the braking surfaces. As with drums, cracked rotors must always be discarded, never repaired. Surface scoring less than 15 thousandths of an inch deep should not affect performance. If scoring is deeper, the rotor should be refinished or replaced. Two less obvious causes of front brake pulsation are uneven rotor thickness and lateral runout in the rotor and bearing system. Lateral runout is a measurement of how much the surface of a rotor or other component deviates from side to side as the rotor turns. High spots on the rotor surface result in uneven contact pressure between the rotor and the lining and cause pulsation when the brakes are applied. Runout may be the result of distortion or warping in the rotor itself, and there may also be runout in the hub and bearing assembly. Total system runout may therefore be a combination of rotor distortion and hub and bearing runout. When two or more small discrepancies combine to produce excessive runout, the condition is referred to as stacked tolerances. It is often possible to eliminate the effect of stack tolerances by rotating or re-indexing the rotor in relation to the hub. Be sure to check rotor surfaces for thickness variation. Use a brake micrometer to measure the thickness in at least four different points. All measurements should be made at points that are the same distance from the edge of the rotor. If rotor thickness varies by more than five ten thousandths of an inch at any two points, 
the rotor should be refinished. Always check the thinnest acceptable measurement against the minimum refinish thickness specification in the rotor specification chart. Remember, if a suitable finish cannot be obtained without dropping below the minimum thickness specification, the rotor must be replaced. The minimum refinish thickness specification is designed to allow for useful rotor life after resurfacing. That's why rotors are replaced if a suitable finish cannot be obtained without going below this specification. Thickness variation or non-parallelism can also cause brake pulsation. Uneven thickness itself is caused by a combination of lateral runout in the rotor, hub and bearing system, caliper drag, and abrasion from the lining material. The combination of slight caliper drag and high spots on the rotor causes the linings to rub against the rotor when the brakes are not applied. Over time, the abrasiveness of the lining material wears the high spots down and produces uneven thickness. When brakes are applied, the thickness variation in the rotor causes uneven pressure and friction as the rotor is clamped between the calipers. The resulting pulsation is transmitted through the brake pedal or may be felt as vibration from the front of the car. Incorrect clearance between the caliper and the bracket stop may cause calipers to drag after the brakes are released. Caliper bracket stops can be filed to increase clearance. Remember, too much clearance may allow the calipers to move and cause a clunk sound as brakes are applied. Typical clearance specification is between 5 thousandths and 12 thousandths inches. Another binding problem occurs when caliper mounting bolts become corroded. Clean lightly rusted bolts and apply Delco silicone lubricant to the bolt sleeve. Heavily corroded bolts should be replaced and be sure to lubricate the bracket stops. 1989 introduced a new design caliper mounting bolt that is more resistant to binding. The new bolts are also available for some previous year models. Part numbers can be found in the know-how reference manual. Let's look now at the use of J37704, a portable brake lathe designed to refinish rotors while they're still mounted on the vehicle. On-car refinishing can compensate for lateral runout in the entire rotor, hub, and bearing assembly. The rotor is, in effect, customized to the axle. Before attaching the lathe, Place the gear selector in neutral and raise the vehicle to a comfortable working height. Select a rotor adapter with the correct number of stud holes. Use wheel nuts to attach the rotor adapter to the hub. To help center the adapter, rotate the rotor while finger tightening the wheel nuts. Snug the nuts. Never use a power wrench to tighten the nuts because the adapter may be damaged. The next step is to attach the lathe to the adapter. Pull out the feeder wheel knob. Then turn the wheel to provide clearance between the rotor and the cutting heads. Rotate the rotor to line up the cap screws on the adapter with the holes on the lathe. Push the lathe onto the adapter and turn the rotor locking the lathe in place. Tighten the cap screws snug. Adjust the lathe cutting head to center the rotor between the cutting arms. Loosen the cutter lock knob and adjust the cutting head. Use one of the four screw holes for adjusting the cutting arms in relation to the rotor. Select the hole that centers the rotor between the cutting arms. Then replace the screw. Next, seat the cutting tool holder squarely in the dovetail and tighten the lock screw. Turn the feeder wheel to bring the cutting head about a half inch from the outside edge of the rotor. Loosen the locking knob and adjust the automatic shutoff. Next, measure for total system runout on the rotor, hub, and bearing assembly. To do this, attach the accessory dial indicator to the lathe and position the dial so that the stylus contacts a stationary part of the car. 
pull out the feeder wheel knob and use the hand crank to rotate the lathe motor and rotor while observing the indicator dial. Zero the indicator needle at the lowest point in the runout and measure the total runout between the highest and lowest points. Adjust the lathe to compensate for runout by tightening one or two of the four adjustment screws on the lathe to reduce runout by half. Be sure to wear protective eye covering when the lathe is running. Pull the feeder wheel knob out and press the green start button on the lathe motor. Now loosen the cutting head lock knob. Rotate the two adjustment knobs counterclockwise to open the cutting arms. Turn the feeder wheel to move the cutting heads halfway to the hub of the rotor. Adjust the inside cutting arm knob so that the cutting head just contacts the rotor surface. Then make the same adjustment for the outside cutting arm. Then move the cutting heads to the cutting start point. Set the cutting arm adjustment knobs for the desired cut. Each increment mark on the cutter adjustment knobs represents four thousandths of an inch. Remove only as much material as is necessary to obtain a good surface finish. Remember, the measurement specification stamped on a rotor is the discard thickness. This is the minimum thickness at which the rotor can be used. Rotors that are at or below this thickness must be discarded. The automatic shutoff stops the lathe motor when the cutting operation is finished. When the cutting operation is complete, use 120 grade emery cloth to burnish the surface of the rotor. Burnishing removes the tiny grooves produced by the lathe cutting heads. These are directional, almost like the grooves in a record. For maximum performance, particularly with semi-metallic linings, a non-directional rotor finish is preferable. The lathe can be used to refinish all rotors on models with four-wheel disc brakes. Uncouple the lathe from the adapter. Remove the adapter and attach the lathe to the other side. Rotate the lathe 180 degrees and repeat the setup and refinishing procedure. Always refinish front or rear brakes in pairs to maintain balance in side-to-side -side braking action. When the calipers and wheels are in place, torque the wheel nuts to the specified torque using an alternating nut tightening sequence. Although using a torque wrench may take a few moments longer, too much torque or tightening of the wheel nuts in the wrong sequence can distort the rotor and at least partly undo the work just completed. When brake surfaces are carefully refinished, runout corrected and calipers properly adjusted and lubricated, chances of a comeback are greatly reduced. Brake systems on today's Buicks incorporate the latest technology, components, and assembly methods. A thorough brake job should restore the fine performance originally designed into the car. Buick customers appreciate thorough, competent workmanship, and a satisfied customer benefits you, your dealership, and the entire Buick organization. The great